Okay, so uh, let's begin the session. If people join, then well and good. Otherwise, anyway, the session is being recorded. So they can take a look at the recording later also. Okay, so I think you should be able to see my screen now, right? All right, so um, since it's just you here today, so uh, again, as always, feel free to ask questions. Any doubt, anything you're not understanding, um, just let me know. All right. Um, all right. So one more person has joined. Okay. So welcome both of you. Welcome to the seventh session of um, the NPTEL course, Essentials of Data Science with R Software. Uh, this is part one where we are discussing probability and statistical inference. So just housekeeping notes. Uh, there are three simultaneous sessions happening each week, Fridays, Saturdays, and Tuesdays. They're being taken by different um, TAs. The material that we are discussing in these sessions would be highly overlapping, but could be slightly different as well. Um, in each of the sessions, uh, the the record the sessions are being recorded, and that's re that recording is being uploaded to YouTube. And any material that's being discussed in these sessions is being uploaded to Google Drive, right? The PPTs and uh, the com the codes, the R codes that we discuss, all of that is being uploaded. And you have access to all of those via the NPTEL page itself, okay? Um, so we are done with half of the course, the live sessions for half the course. Today is the seventh session, all right? So is there anything that you would like to discuss or talk about pertaining to the course or pertaining to these live sessions or anything else. So again, these are live sessions. The more interactive they are, the better. So we'll be starting off with a discussion of what was taught in this week. And then there'll be a little bit, so it's going to be both theory as well as some R commands. And then we are going to go and practice some questions. Uh, some of these are overlapping with the questions that were discussed in the lectures and some of these are on the lines of what sort of questions you have in the assignment for this week. So we'll take a look at all of that. And then at the end, we, if, if time permits, hopefully it does, uh, we'll take a look at the last week's assignment solution and see if there's anything, anything confusing in that. Okay. So uh, both of you, please feel free to unmute yourselves and discuss, ask questions. Anything that you're not clear on, anything that I say incorrect here and there, just you can point it out, okay? And otherwise, you can always use the chat option also. All right, so let's start. So this week was talking about a few different kinds of distributions, probability distributions of continuous random variables, right? So, um, so again, just to tell you, the random variables they can assume any value. So whatever the range be, ideally for anything, the range can be minus infinity to infinity, but otherwise the range can be a, between two numbers also. So anything below that number, the probability becomes zero. Anything above that number, the probability becomes zero. And uh, uh, the distribution is the distribution of the probabilities, right? What sort of a trajectory, what sort of a pattern, the probability of those random variables follow. So the random value, uh, the random variable itself is not the distribution that we're talking about, but the probability with which each random variable can uh, occur or can be chosen or whatever sort of term we use for it, that follows a particular distribution, right? So, and when we talk about distributions, we are mainly talking about, first of all, the, uh, the probability density function, uh, which has that shape that we normally talk about. So if I just draw it out, right? So we have been talking about distributions that look like this, distribution that might look like this, or the other way, or distributions that may look something like this, right? So this, these are the kinds of distributions we'll talk about today. So that's the PDF, right? Uh, the probability density function and on the other hand, when we talk about uh, probability up to a certain value, right? So let's say 
if this value of x is what I'm interested in. And if you're interested in everything up to that value, so that is what we talk about the CDF or the cumulative density function. And of course, you can subtract two cumulative density functions to get a small patch, or you can do a one minus that cumulative density function to get the other half, right? So we'll just take a look at all of that again. But these are some very basic concepts which we've taught in the initial week or two. And uh, then we are building on that further. And one thing to remember about continuous random variables is that point probabilities will be zero because probability, the total probability is actually the integration, right? So integration means the area under the curve. And at any point, so if I have, let's say this value of X and I just draw this line, then this line does not actually have any area, right? The area is equal to zero. Therefore, the probability is also zero, okay? So, um, and just to make it clear, this is your random variable on the x-axis and it is fx on the y-axis. So the density function or the probability of each value of x uh, is, or uh, rather the fx is on the y-axis, but the total probability uh, for a range or for until that value, that is given by the integration. Okay, so this is something you just have to remember about continuous variables. Fine. So the first one that was discussed this week was the continuous uniform distribution. Okay, so again, so let's just draw it out. So let's say this is A and this is B. So irrespective of whether A and B are positive values or they may one of them is zero or both of them are negative, it does not matter. So this is your x-axis. So this is again fx, right? Now here we say that at this particular value of fx, whatever this value is, um, between a and b, the random variable x has a has this probability. So let's call it p for now. And anything and less than that or above that, the probability is zero, right? So it's something like this. The pro if you want to draw the curve, you draw it something like this. It's going and then it's coming down again, right? So now what is this value of P? Now the area, right? The area has to be one. So again, so simple. Uh, what is the area of a rectangle? It is length into breadth. So length is equal to B, my B, yeah, B minus A. And uh, the width here, let's say that's P, that's equal to 1. So P is equal to 1 minus B, uh, 1 upon B by A, right? So that is what this thing is. This P is equal to 1 upon B minus B. This is ensuring that the area of this rectangle is equal to 1. So that's the PDF. And then as we have been doing for the discrete random variables, the expectation and the variance for each of them it's, it's just nice if you can remember these values. So some of these values would be very intuitive. So you don't exactly need to remember it. So for example, when you're talking about a uniform distribution, so it's like taking the average of everything, right? So average, you get the middle point. So you get A plus B divided by two. Variance, you can calculate the variance by the formulas that we have talked about earlier, right? The integration of, so the expectation of x and the expectation of x square and then you square it up and you subtract that. So you can calculate the variance that way you will get this value. But if you can remember that will be quicker. For for courses like these, for exams like these, uh, remember it's either remembering formulas or doing quick derivations. It's up to you whichever works best for you. All right. Are we good till here? Any just Give me a thumbs up or just say, okay, if everything's fine. Perfect. All right, great. So um, this is this was a continuous uniform distribution. Um, there was this concept of inverse transformation also introduced. So what we are doing is we are applying a, yeah, all right, great. So what we are doing is we are applying a function on a random variable. And let's say that function is giving us a uniform distribution. That's what we have been talking about in probability, right? So uh, if 
you've had maths before, there is a concept of the inverse of that function. So even even if you don't, uh, if you're not familiar with the inverse concept also, then also it's fine. Uh, so the thing is that if you're squaring something up, you get the answer. You find out one by two of it. So you, instead of squaring it up, you find the square root of it. And that gives you the original number back, right? That's the concept of inverse. You are applying some sort of transformation, some mathematical operation. If you if you apply the opposite of that function onto the answer, you get the original back, right? So that is sort of the inherent uh, way how random numbers are generated for any function that you want. So if you remember, there are these R norm, R binom, R unif, these functions that were talked about in the last week and this week. So this is how they've been doing the course, the lectures did not elaborate on this. And I'm also not going to elaborate on this because there's a lot to lot that would have to be talked about. I am also not entirely familiar with how um how it's exactly done internally. But somewhat the just to give you an idea. So if you're finding, so again the same thing, you're finding the nth power of something. So you get u, so you find the one by nth power, you get x. Right, so x becomes your uh, random variable, and u is actually here. Wherever I've written u, that's actually denoting uniform distribution. But again, uh, so from any uniform distribution, you can extract any other uh, function. So, for example, here, if this was the function, you find out the inverse of it. Right, so this is there. You solve it up. Basically, it's it's sort of doing algebra, right? Finding out x in terms of u. So this is in first transformation. Again, think about it. Consider it to be simple algebra. Okay. Um. All right. So this was normal distribution. Then the major bit that was covered this week was the normal or the Gaussian distribution. And as we have been seeing, every distribution is given in terms of some parameters. There may be one or two parameters, right? So for example, for the uniform distribution, these were A and B. So if suppose something like this is given that U bracket one comma two, then it means the value of A is one and the value of B is two. Typically, uh, as you can see in this definition, we should always be greater than or equal to A. All right. Okay. Uh, normal distribution is in terms of two parameters, that is mu and sigma square. This is a formula, it's a complicated formula. Again, if you can remember this, it would help, although you would not be expected to solve it in any, you would definitely not be expected to solve it. So it's okay if you don't remember, but this would come up sooner or later if you are somewhat in this field. So it's just good to have this um, formula in your mind somewhat right and if you solve it and if you find the expectation and variance you'll see that this mu is actually the mu that we know the mean and sigma square here which is the denominator and also sigma here that's so sigma square is the variance this is why these um yeah, these you no know, notation this notation is used right this is why the term here is is denoted as mu and the one here is denoted as sigma square so that's there now again, this is the PDF. You can do, you can calculate the CDF for it for anything, but this would be very, very complicated. You can understand solving this uh, would be, you know, integrating it would be complicated. So you're not expected to do that calculation. So there are three ways you can say that you can find the value. Uh, there could be either some tables so there is like, if you're familiar with the log table, there is also a table for normal distribution. We will take a look at that today. More so now that you have um, uh, like online platforms. So something like this, I think I have the link open here. So yeah, so there's this online calculator that you can use. It would also give you a visual depiction of what value you're looking at, right? So I will come to it in a little while. Let me just brief you on what we are doing. So this calculator, this online calculator can be used to 
find out the CDF of a normal distribution. That is value of getting a probability up to that certain number, right? That's the CDF. Uh, the third way is through R, right? So if you remember, we would have the P norm function for this to find out the CDF, which also we will see in the session. Fine. So uh, normal distribution is uh, denoted it the two parameters that will help you make a normal distribution curve are mu and sigma square the mean and the variance now any so would one of you just let so oh we have a lot of people joined up now all right great um so in case so if i just want to would you like to get a recap of what we've discussed we've only been talking about continuous random variable for now uh, sorry, the continuous uniform distribution for now. Uh, we're, we're just starting with the normal distribution. Okay, so again, let me just briefly recap. Uh, normal distribution is denoted by two parameters, mu and sigma square. It is of this formula. So you do see mu and sigma and sigma square appearing in these in the formula. If you find out the expectation, which is the mean and the variance, you would see that it comes up to be this parameter mu and variance comes up to be the parameter sigma square. Okay, so this is why these symbols are being used to denote it. This is the PDF of the normal distribution. Um, the CDF, typically the way we would calculate is through integration, but that would be difficult because the formula is relatively complicated. Okay, so instead of manually calculating, there are three options available. The first one is going to be through tables where for a particular value of uh, mu and sigma square and a particular value of x, you can calculate what the corresponding uh, CDF is. The other way is through some websites online, which will give you the CDF value, which we're going to see, which is just going to be helpful. It was This was not discussed in the lecture, but this would give you a visual depiction of what probability you are calculating. So it might just make it slightly simpler to understand. And the third way is to do it through RStudio, R or RStudio, and you're using some of the R commands. So um, so this is the calculator that I was talking about. So you can see here, um, you can input a value of mu and a value of sigma. So sigma is a uh, standard deviation, right? And that, so currently, the values have been, they, these are the default values, they're already input. So you can see this is what the curve looks like. It is symmetric and it is symmetric about zero. Now, uh, a few things were discussed that what would happen if the variance is increased, what would happen if the variance is decreased? So let's say, so now you can see the area under the curve has to be one, okay? So you can see here at the highest point, at the highest point being the mean, which is zero in this case, the fx, the value of PDF is something around 0.4, okay? Now, if I increase the variance from one, if I increase it to two, I just press enter. So you see my plot, it's still symmetric about zero. Uh, of course, the axis here has changed a bit. The y-axis here has also changed a bit. So now the graph has switched. It has broadened, but it has also decreased in height to ensure that the area is still one. Uh, if I do, if I change the value of mu from zero to minus two, the graph is going to stay the same. The y-axis would stay the same. It's just the x-axis is going to shift. So now two has become the mean. So it's shifted a little to the left. So this is what you can, um, this is how the normal distribution is looking. Now, let's say I want to calculate what is the probability of, so let's say my random variable here, it's going to be something around one. So I want to find out the, let's say I am interested in the CDF. So CDF is always less than a certain value from minus infinity up to that value. So I am interested in the value up to one. So if I do a, I do one here and I press enter. So now you see uh, the color coding here, uh, maybe this would be a little better. Yeah, so here, this is one. That's my limit. And what I'm calculating is the red portion. So you can see that the majority of my plot is shaded, and which is indicating I'm, I've got a large value. If instead I'm interested in what is the probability that value is 
greater than or equal to 1. So I'll do a, this one here. And now the probability is 1 minus whatever I got. So initially it was 0 0.93 something. So now it's 0 0.06. The two things add up to give you 1. Right? And this is the value of mu that we set. This was standard deviation and this was variance. Right? So this is something we can use um, again if need be to answer questions. All right, so you are not going to be expected to solve for CDF. Fine. So now, um, so here what we did was we had to give three values, right? Mu and sigma and uh, x. Now, wouldn't it be simpler if somehow we have some fixed value of mu and sigma always, Right, so the initial plot that you saw, which was centered around zero, and the variance was one, and standard deviation also one. That sort of a plot that is also one version of a normal distribution. It's called the standard normal distribution. That has mu zero and variance one. Uh, so you can plug in these values here. Sigma becomes one, mu becomes zero, sigma square also becomes one. You solve it up, so it becomes slightly simpler, right? So of course, expectation is zero, variance is one. This is called the Z transformation. So what you have basically done is, let's say you had a normally distributed random variable X. If you subtract from X, if you subtract mu, and if you divide that value by sigma, the, the variable that you get, that's also a random variable, right? You started with a random variable X, you subtract something and you divide something. You still get a random variable. That random video, that random variable also has a normal distribution. But now that normal distribution mean of it is is zero, and the standard deviation or the variance is one. So you have transformed your random variable from a normally distribu normally distributed variable to a to a variable which is, which has a standard normal distribution. So we will see a few more things about it in one or two slides later. But this is, it's a relatively complicated concept, might not be very intuitive in the first book, but it does make a lot of things simpler. Okay, so um, higher or lower values of sigma or sigma square, different values of mean. So that one we sort of saw from um, that web page, right? If you have a higher value of sigma, sigma square, it means the graph is going to sort of shift downwards and it's going to become broader. And depending on different values of mean, the graph is going to shift left and right. But sigma and mean don't exactly have any relation. For the same value of sigma, you can have different mu. For the same value of mu, you can have different sigma. So you can't predict one from the other. Okay, so that's one thing. And uh, so this is roughly what we, so you, whenever you are transforming a random variable, um, the it's it's highly probable that based on what you're multiplying or adding or subtracting or dividing, the mean and variance are going to change, right? So this is one type of transformation we did. We are subtracting and dividing. So the mean and variance they're from mu to mu from mu and sigma square they are changing to zero and one. And what is normally happening is that if you are multiplying something to x, um, the expectation value also gets multiplied. Everything. Whatever was multiplied gets multiplied. Whatever was added got added. And in variance, we have seen previously also, when you're adding something or when you're subtracting something, that's just going to shift things left and right. So the variance never gets affected. The variance is only affected by things that are multiplied or divided. So here it was multiplied by A. The random variable was, was multiplied by A. So the variance... Um, I think I made a mistake here. So it's not going to be sigma square. It, this would be sigma square. Okay. Yeah, I'll correct it. So the variance is going to be um, square of whatever was multiplied into the original variance. Okay, just give me a second. So this is what the normal distribution looks like, right? Uh, it's centered around mean and uh, sigma or sigma square is actually indicating how uh, far through, throughout the graph can be. So now if you think about it, if 
So there would be one sigma's difference left and right, two sigma's, three sigma's. It's just any value, for example, right? Now, if sigma was smaller, variance was smaller, when the, the graph is thinner, so everything is going to be much closer to each other. And when sigma is bigger, these are all going to be far apart. But what stays constant, what is a natural property of the concept of variance itself? Sorry. Yeah. So that is that if you take a look at mu minus sigma and mu plus sigma, so the difference between these two values, um, this is two sigma, right? The range that you're looking at is two sigma. That two sigma has 68% of your observations or the area is 68% or 0.68 is the probability, right? Again, uh, having like remembering these three values would be very useful. Uh, though the application has not been discussed as such in the lecture, but uh, suppose the question is that the mean of something, mean time of arrival of a train or battery life or whatever things that we have, whatever examples we've seen, let's say that is something 20. So what is the probability? And, and so the mean is 20 and let's say the variance is four, which means the, or let's say the variance is nine. So just, okay, let me just say, so let's say something has a mean 20 and let's say something has a variance nine. So this would indicate that the sigma value of sigma is three. So you want to find the probability um, that your x is between, let's say, 23 and 17. If this is what you're interested in, and if it's following a normal distribution, so you can see these values are actually mu plus sigma and mu minus sigma, right? 20 plus 3 and 20 minus 3. So the probability is 68%. So that's going to be equal to 0.68. Likewise, if you're interested in mu plus two sigma and mu minus two sigma, so the whole range being four sigma, then that would be 95%. And then mu plus three sigma and mu minus three sigma, so whole range of six sigmas, that's going to be 99.7%, right? Uh, so this is again a property of normal distribution. It would be applicable irrespective of the values of mu and sigma, okay? All good till here? Fine. Um, if there is nothing else, then uh, let's continue. So we briefly talked about the standard normal distribution. All right, great. So we briefly talked about the standard normal distribution, right? So what we are doing is, uh, anyway, the normal distribution is, uh, it's it's a symmetric plot. But now the standard normal is going to be symmetric about, um, zero. Right, so it would also be symmetric about positive and negative values, right? Something two and something minus two. You can say something about it, as we'll just see in some of these uh, formulas just below, right? So, for any normally distributed random variable, you can transform it into a standard normal distribution by subtracting values of subtracting the mean from it and dividing that thing by the standard deviation or sigma, okay? So now what happens is, so let's take a look. So what plot we are talking about here is this, this is going to be zero, right? And so this is mu, this is zero, um, and sigma is equal to one, right? Fine, okay, so let me see if I can squish all of this in one plot. But anyway, so now this, whenever you have a lesser than symbol, we are talking about CDF, cumulative density function, right? So cumulative density function for, let's say for something which is less than minus A. So minus A would be on the ne ne uh, left side, right? So let's say this is minus A. So whenever we are interested in values less than this, so this is the part that we are shading, right? So let's call the shaded area. So what we're doing is we're integrating from minus infinity to minus A and we get alpha, right? So this is okay. 
makes sense right the area here is alpha now likewise let's say we are interested in so it is a symmetric plot so if here it's a here it's going to be, i mean on the left it was minus a so here it's going to be a now if we are interested in values greater than a which is not cdf but okay we are anyway interested in this value for example now it was a symmetric plot so minus a the left of it and a the right of it these have the same areas so this area even though you're doing a different integration you're doing a to infinity the area is still going to come up to alpha you can calculate it it will come up to alpha you can see that visually here we can also take a look at that web page and try to enter some values and you will see it's coming up to be the same value okay so this is there um now instead if we were interested in the cdf for a so it's going to be the whole left thing so that left portion which is this unshaded area here and the purple area the entire thing so maybe i should draw it again so let's say it's this thing this is the mean this is a let's say this was minus a now let's say i'm interested in less than a so the cdf of a so i'm covering this whole thing right now what is remaining this bit the whole area was one i'm removing this area i know the area of this portion was alpha so the whole the shaded thing here then in orange that's going to be one minus alpha right so that's also understandable and so from from these two things uh from so this is basically this one and this one is the purple one here so this thing so this is alpha this is one minus alpha you add them up you get one the whole area makes sense right um and then this one if you're interested in now you're interested in the middle zone here right this bit so what you're doing is you'll calculate two cdfs so up to a and up to minus a so which is the uh do i have this one here so it's going to be this thing this shaded area and do i have the purple one here this is the purple one and this one's the one in yellow or orange right so the orange one here was yeah so i hope the calculation is okay okay i think i did not write this line properly mm. okay you can you can solve this one up Right, but it's going to give you two alpha minus one. Just check and let me know if it's correct. I think it should be okay, but uh, yeah. Okay, finally, um, if when we're talking about the standard normal distribution, it is symmetric about zero, right? So if you want to calculate the CDF at zero, it's going to be half a point five, right? Now, there was one more statement in the lecture videos, which was this one. Uh, okay, I think I messed up something here. Let me let me check this statement. But um, okay, yeah, so this one right here. So there something for this one, what was shown in the video was that let's say this is minus a and this is a this is alpha by two and this is alpha by two something like this was given right so a lot of times what happens is if you've heard the concept of significance many a times what people are interested in is the fix is a fixed value of alpha so whenever we have been talking about cdfs we are interested in only the left side or only the right side right so that becomes like a one-tailed analysis. 
So in that case, that one shaded area, whatever sh area you're shading is called alpha. When you're shading two areas, two tails, you are interested in calling the total area to be alpha. So each of the half areas become alpha by two. Okay. It's not always, uh, so I'll not go into a lot of it, but it was just to tell you that don't get confused why this was happening. Okay. If both the left and right extremes, they are alpha by two, then this formula makes sense, right? You are interested in the middle area, it's going to be one minus the extremes. Uh, I'm really sorry about this statement here. I've done some mistake here. Uh, I'll just correct it and upload it, upload the right one. There was just one other formula in the lectures. I have swapped that with something else. Okay, so these are some properties of the standard normal distribution and you can see this is quite helpful, okay? You've simplified the formula for the normal distribution by replacing mu and sigma with zero and one respectively. And there are, and because of the symmetric nature of this distribution, a lot of these things, you just have this one value alpha and everything can sort of be written in that term. Okay. Um, all right. So what further happens when you transform your X into Z? So let's say the, the question said that, uh, so let's say for the question, your mu was 20, the value that we just saw, let's say sigma square was nine, and you are interested in a probability that X should be less than or equal to, uh, let's say 19. Let's say this is what the formula is. I hope this notation uh, makes sense to everybody, right? This, these are the three things you would get in your question. What is the mean of a distribution? If something is normally distributed, what is the mean and what is the variance of that? And then what is the probability that, um, say, up to 19 boxes are sold or something like that? So this is what you are interested in. It's going to be a lot of calculations. So now what you do is, take a look here. Let's say you are replacing A becomes 19, mu is 20, sigma is 3 here, right? So, you, so within the bracket, both sides, you are subtracting mu, both sides, you are dividing sigma. Simple algebra is what we're doing, right? The sign stays the same because you're not multiplying anything by a minus sign or anything. So sign say, stays intact. This term that you see on the left-hand side, this is what we're defining as Z. And this transformation now, so X was a random variable which had a normal distribution. Now Z has a random variable which has a standard normal distribution. Easy. So now instead of looking at this 19, we are instead looking at z less than equal to, so 19 minus 20, so that's uh, minus one, and divided by three, so that's minus one by three. So now, instead of calculating this probability, which was, which had a standard, which had a normal distribution, you are now calculating this probability, which is now a standard normal. So just, so we are not doing anything fancy, but let's go to, um, this thing here. So if I can put it side by side, I hope you can still see my screen, right? Both left and right are both visible. Okay. Just let me know in case the screen is not visible. So the, okay. So initially that is what we were talking about, right? So we have 20 mu is 20 for some distribution and let's say sigma was 3. So this is what it looks like, right? Now we are interested in values less than or less than equal to 19 here. So 19, now this is what we get, 0. 0.36944, okay, fine. So uh, this one, right, the first one. The, the web app does not have a problem in calculating any value, but it's just simpler when we have a standard normal distribution. So now, instead of this distribution, we will convert it to, so this was 0.36944, okay. Uh, now, let's say here we had zero, here we had one, and now let's say here we write minus 0 
okay so you can see it's pretty much the same value right so uh, so that's it right you got the same value calculate and you you get the same thing um all right so that's that's okay fine and so this is when it's less than a similarly you can do a greater than a also so whenever it's greater than something you calculate it in terms of the cdf so you do a one minus thing on it you transform that so it's one minus that change and whenever it's between two values again uh, so this one the center thing is your standard normal variable and on the so you can subtract the larger minus the smaller cdf and that's okay too okay fine so this is how you will be transforming any random variable into a standard normal random variable um now instead of a single random variable if you have multiple random variables uh which are normally distributed and if you're interested in what pattern, what distribution would the mean of those have? So the mean is also uh, a normally distributed random variable. The expectation of, so if the expect expectation of all of these normal distributions were mu, then the expectation of the average of those is also going to be mu, but the variance is going to be slightly smaller, right? You're dividing it by n, because now imagine you had a lot of, normal distributions they are pretty much the same distribution right but now what you're doing is you're increasing the sample size you have n times the data so if you remember our initial discussion a week or two ago when we were talking about sample and population so the always it's always good to have a larger sample size to reduce your variance that is what we talked about right so here also basically you're increasing your sample size so you are decreasing your variance. The variance is now divided by n. Okay. Um, then, since we have been talking about normal distribution and we've been talking about standard normal distribution, so why stay restricted to simplifying normal distribution to standard normal when you can also simplify binomial and Poisson distribution to a standard normal distribution, right? So this is what the binomial distribution was right this is what the probability and um, this is the pdf and um this is uh, now now remember binomial and binomial is uh it's it's a discrete random variable right but for certain values it can be approximated to a normal distribution uh this was talked about a little more elaborately in the lectures but basically what's there if if value of n into p and the value of n p into 1 minus p, which is basically your expectation and variance. If both expectation and variance are greater than 5, then you can approximate a binomial distribution to a standard normal variable. And again, what you're doing is the same thing. You are uh, subtracting the mean, which is n p in this case, and dividing it by the standard deviation. So remember, standard deviation is the root of variance. So root of the variance. The only thing is, since you are converting a discrete variable to a continuous variable, you add 0.5 to it. I have I am not very sure on how this was derived, but this is called the continuity correction. So when you do that, um, and then of course this x you are converting into the random variable, you're subtracting mean and dividing by the standard deviations, this is what it becomes right likewise you have the Poisson distribution here both expectation and variance is lambda so when that lambda is greater than five then it works well so here also you are subtracting lambda and dividing by the root of lambda and also adding 0.5 for the continuity correction for a discrete to continuous shift okay um so that's what was discussed for the normal distribution just give me a second. Okay. And um, the last thing that was discussed was an exponential distribution. So if you remember the geometric distribution, it is pretty much on the same lines. 
okay um so it's it's a slightly different formula but it has very similar um thing that after how much would you get so there it was after how many trials would you have the first success here also after how much time or how much of the continuous distribution would you be interested in so it's always greater than something right um that's how the exponential distribution is defined so this is the pdf this is going to be the cdf again in just integration of this thing gives you the um cdf the expectation is one by lambda so lambda is the parameter that's being used here right uh variance is one by lambda square this also has a lack of memory same thing if whether you're looking at the interval 1 to 10 or whether you're looking at the interval um, 11 to 20, it does not matter, right? And um, something which was sort of, I just saw something might confuse you in one of the questions of um, that we'll just take a look here and in the assignment. Um, can you think about what is, um, what could be the relation between x and lambda, the units of, or the dimensions of uh, x and lambda. Any idea? So x is your random variable, right? So let's say it has the distribution, it has a unit kg. What would be the unit of lambda? Should it have a unit or should it not have a unit? If it has a unit, what would be that? If x has kg. Any idea? You can use, you can take a look at any of the formulas here and make a guess. Actually, it does not have to be a guess. One of these three will directly tell you what the unit of lambda is. If the unit of x is kgs or anything else, but let's say kgs for now, what is the unit of lambda? Think about it. It's it's pretty much in front of you. Take a look at the third equation here. No, nobody wants to answer. Okay, we are slowly going towards the problem solving bit of today's class. So I really hope there you're all going to be more interactive. Okay, so I was talking about um, this one here. Okay. Okay, so I'm saying that if the dimension or the unit of x is kg, it's x is a random variable, right? So depending on what the question is, let's say the unit of x is kgs. So what is the unit of lambda? Should lambda have a unit? Should it not have a unit? What would that unit be? Okay, so what I'm in looking for is Yes, lambda is the parameter here, but would it have a unit? Like, would it be kg, kg square, kg inverse, kg to the power 3, or would it be a unitless dimension? So, if you take a look at this one here, it's a constant, that's right. So, lambda is fixed, but it would have a unit. Right, so if you take a look at this formula here, so lambda is one by expectation of x. See, expectation is mean, and mean is always going to have units of the random variable itself, right? So it's going to be one by kg. So the dimensions of these, or I should say units, they are going to be, so if x is kg, this is going to be kg inverse. If x is meters, it's going to be one by meter. If x is going to be per second, lambda is going to be seconds. 
all right i hope it's all it it i hope it makes sense this is just for a double check i'm not telling you which question you might face the problem in but we are having units for mean yes you would have units for mean what does mean indicate right so let's say typically what is the average height of people in a classroom the height of everybody is let's say you talk about height in centimeters so the average height would also be in centimeters right average mean expectation that's the same term so if the unit of expectation or mean or average is centimeters and if that distribution let's say has a geometric distribution and if there's some parameter lambda then the unit for lambda is going to be one upon centimeters based on this formula likewise the unit of variance is actually going to be centimeter square the unit of standard deviation is centimeter but the unit of variance is centimeter square. Okay. This is just for clarity sake. All right. Please, if something's still not clear, let me know. Fine. So um, this was the theory discussion. I do have the um some things written in R. Most of it overlaps with what was discussed last time also. Um, so let me just clear this thing. Okay. Uh, just to tell you a little bit more about our studio in case you're not familiar with this. So I had been practicing some, you know, something to demonstrate to you. So all of this is clustered here. I want to get this cleared. So I'm going to press control L here. Okay. I have my cursor here. I'll press control L. So you see everything is gone. It's all clear now. The console is clear. I have also been making some plots. So I'll just press this broom symbol here. And it says, are you sure you want to clear all the plots in history? I'll press yes. And that's also clear now. Okay. Um, I'm just going to increase the font a bit. Okay. And this one is fine. So fine. So we, as always, there are four sets of commands. The first one is for PMF. So that starts with D. So D unif, D norm, uh, D X. That's going to be the three things we're looking at today. For CDF, it starts with P. For finding the quantile or for finding the value or finding the probability, like basically finding up to which value do you have that much probability. That's Q. And then if you want to generate random numbers from that distribution, you're using R. Okay. Um, now, last time what we had been doing is when we wanted to plot any of these distributions, we used to use the plot function, right? Um, so this was, let's say the D unif function. So what it does is I say minimum 20, minimum zero, maximum 20. And what if the value was, um, between 1 and 30. So it gives me these probabilities. So you can see here already that up to 20, the probability is 1 by 20, right? 1 by 20 is 0 0.05 and the probability is 0 0.05 fixed for those. But for values of x greater than 20, it's straight away 0. And it makes sense, right? Uh, so now if I want to, if I want to plot this, I can also just for clarity's sake, So if I'm I just zoom this in, right? So you can see for the first 20 values for within that range, it's what you would expect, and then it's all shrunken down. It's straight away zero. So this is what you are plotting. You are explicitly saying plot from 1 to 30. Um, that should be the x value, that should be the input to the uh, DNF function. There's a slightly quicker way to do it. So you again specify the min and max, but instead of giving the explicit values of x, you just say x. You let it be x. And, but you don't just run this. So if you run this, it's going to give you an error. But what you do is you enclose this thing into the function curve. And then you run this. So now what you see here, something happened. 
it shows a straight line. For me, the y-axis, okay, that makes sense. It's it's 0 0.05, which is that probability. But the x-axis does not make sense to me. So what I do is I explicitly set the x limits. So the way I set x limits, so x limits is an argument of the curve function. So the first argument of the curve function is that d unif thing. And the second argument is d lim, uh, sorry, x lim. And I'll say x lim is equal to c. If you remember, the c is the combined function. So it's combining minus 3 and 25. So minus 3 is the lower x limit. 25 is the upper x limit. And when I run this, so now you see the nature, what you get. Between 0 and 10, 20, you have a fixed value, and that's 0 0.05. Less than that, up to minus 3. I had just shown it minus 3. And up to 25, which I set the limit as 25, it's back to 0. So this is a better depiction, right? It's it's much simpler to write. And it's a much better plot than those circles. Okay. Um, again, when you want to calculate the CDF, you want to calculate CDF up to a certain value, right? So that you can calculate here. So if you had CDF up to five, right? So this portion is shaded and you can very well see it's one fourth of the total area. So it's going to be one by four of one. So that's 0.25 and that's what you get. If you're interested in greater than five. So again, similar thing as we were seeing here, right? When it's less than X or it's greater than X. So by default, lower tail is true. So it's less than this value of Q. But when you say lower tail falls, so you're not looking at the lower tail, you're looking at the maybe like the upper tail. So that's greater than. So that would give you 0.75, right? Makes sense. 0.25 and 0.75. Then quantile is basically telling you what value of x, up to what value of x do you get 60% of your observations or 60% of the probability. So very well, you can see that at 12, somewhere here, it's going to be shading 60% of the area. Here also, you have the lower tail false option. So it's going to give you 8. At 8 and above, you get 60% of the area. Random number generator. Again, um, I want to calculate 10. I want to find 10 random numbers that fall within this thing. So... If you remember the formula of mean and variance for a uniform continuous distribution, it is a plus b by 2. So that's 10. And variance is b minus a whole square divided by um, 12. Right. So if you do that, 20 squared, that's 400. 400 divided by 12, that's 33.33. That's the variance. And this is what we've been seeing in the last also. When you calculate just 10, 10 variables, when you calculate, like, when you find out just 10 random numbers and you calculate their mean and variance, they may be far away from what you would expect. So you expect 10 and 33.3, but instead of 10, you get 13. Instead of 33.3, you get 20, which is a very huge difference. But instead, if you calculate, if you take 100 observations, then it becomes very close to 10. And then this is also very close to 33. So it gets better. If you do it for a thousand times, you will get even closer approximations. Similar with the normal distribution, right? So um, you can use the curve function. So again, by default, the curve function is always going to show you how the nature is between 0 and 1 in the x-axis. But mostly, 0 and 1 is not enough. So you need to set the limits. You This is a little bit of a hidden trial that what limits works best. So once I have like between minus five and five, I can see the standard normal curve coming up, right? Since I've set mean to zero and standard deviation to one, <coughs> the it's it's a standard normal distribution, okay? If I don't want a standard normal distribution, I can change the values of mean and standard deviation. Um, so just, just remember that here in R, you're using standard deviation instead of variance. So, it's, so you're specifying sigma. Right here, you also you were specifying sigma. This is what you are sort of denoting normal distribution with. But just be careful, right? So don't confuse between the two things. 
here also um you can have the cdf you can calculate cdf you can calculate uh the quantiles and you can generate random numbers and see how close they become to your expected mean and standard deviation let me skip through this because it's going to be the same discussion again um so yeah now for the exponential distribution uh, again the parameter here that it takes is rate lambda that you have seen there that is actually the rate right so um so again let's say the rate is 2 you do that now remember exponential distribution even though it's continuous it's only after zero okay so if you see this one between zero and infinity you have a certain value but less than zero it's zero right so even when i'm setting the x limits i can always set the x limits but i know that below zero it's going to be zero so you, it's like a sanity check here that okay it's behaving the way it should again pdf cdf montiles you can do now just to uh, clarify something about um, the mean and standard deviation. So, yeah, okay. So, now, if you remember, the mean is 1 by lambda and the variance is 1 by lambda squared. So, if you, if the rate here, if mm, lambda is equal to 2, then mean is what and variance is what? What do you expect? Like if lambda is 2, mean is 1 by lambda. So that is what? Wake up everybody. Please answer these questions. If lambda is 2, what is mean? That's 1 by lambda, right? So that's 0.5 and the variance is 1 by lambda square. So that's 1 by 4. So that's going to be 0.25. Okay. Uh, just to see when you have 10 observations, you will be a little far away from what you would expect. So it's not close to 0.5 or 0.25. But when you have a large number of observations, it becomes much closer to the values you would expect. Okay. All right. So again, so you have these formulas, these commands in R that you can use um, to calculate. So all four of all four combinations that we have seen, uh, PDF, CDF, quantiles, and random number generators. We've seen these for all for very for, for a lot of distributions, right? We saw the discrete ones last week and we've seen the continuous ones this week. So with that, we've discussed what was discussed this week. Now we have some practice questions. A lot of people have left the group, the session, but that's okay. So I do have 10 questions and we do have quite a good amount of time left, right? We, we have 45 minutes, but uh, I don't want to stretch it until the very end. So I would really like if you can be more interactive if you can just unmute yourself quickly give the answer and we'll move on to the next question we don't need to solve the entire thing uh because it's more important to understand how to approach it than to solve it actually but up to you we can solve the whole thing also okay fine so again this was the question oh thank you so much yeah okay so um so this question uh, was talked about in one of the lectures also. So suppose a train um, arrives every 15 minutes and what is the waiting time for, to catch the train if it's if it's uniformly distributed with this given density, right? So, so it's every 15 minutes, right? So again, it's going to be like this. Oh, I'm mean, sorry. Uh, Yeah. 
Okay, this is going to be 15 here. So this is what it looks like, right? Let's say this is zero. This is one by 15. This is going to be zero. This is going to be 15, right? So what is the probability for waiting up to five minutes? So probability x less than five. Uh, what is the probability waiting for five minutes? x is equal to five. And what is the probability for waiting for at least five minutes? Like this. Let's say something like this. Okay. So um, for questions like these, you don't have to integrate them also. You can just take a look. So this is a simple rectangle, right? And we understand that CDFs and all of this is just an integration or it's just the area of that rectangle, right? So can one of you tell me what rectangles are we looking at in each of the three cases? One by three. For the first one, that is one by three, right? So we are looking at five. We are looking at the shaded area. So that's going to be one by three, right? Or 33%. It's perfect. What about the second one? That's very nice, right? So this is a point probability. So just this line here, that's zero, right? Good. And what about the last one? Let's say this one here, greater than five. So we're looking at this whole area. That's going to be the remaining bit, right? Two by three, perfect, great. So. It's a very simple question. Again, you can solve this by using the actual formula. So integrating. So uh, it's going to look something like this. So integrating 1 by 15 from, for let's say for this one, for the third one, it's 5 to 15 dx. Um, then 1 by 15 is a constant. It comes out. The integration of dx is x. You do it from 5 to 15. So it's 15 minus 5 by 15, that's 10 by 15, that's 2 by 3. So you get the same answer, right? You can also do it through the R formula, right? So the formula would have would be P unif. Okay, so let's just, for the sake of completion, uh, let's just do it. So we have P unif. Uh, so Q here is going to be, let's say, 5. So let's say we are calculating one minus that whole thing. So one minus P unit comma min is zero in this case. Max is 15, right? So it's 0. 0.66 because it's because P unit gives you the CDF up to that point. So up to five. So we are doing one minus up to five. So that's giving us 0. 0.67. So all of the three ways you can solve it, it's giving the right answer. So you understood how to go about it. Okay, um, next question. Um, now we're talking about normal distribution because you've been given something with as a mu and a sigma square, right? So now you can just take a look here again. So mu, which is nothing but mean. Uh, so weight of boxes and mean is kg. So mean has the same thing as the random variable. And sigma square, since it is a square of something, so the unit is square, kg square, okay? It's always good to just know this, um, all right? Now, um, you can calculate multiple things out of it. So the farmer wants to avoid customers being unsatisfied because of what if the box is too low in weight? So they want to know what is the probability that the that it's a box with a weight less than 18 kgs. Or the farmer also does not want to have losses by selling boxes which are very heavy. So the farmer wants to know the probability that a box has a weight more than 22 kgs. Um, you can also find probabilities that how many boxes are the optimal weight between 19 and 21 kgs. And what is the probability that there's a box which has it has like more than 25 kgs, right? So now there are several ways you can solve it. I've just given you some pointers here. 
So the first thing is you can solve it manually. You can write formulas, you can calculate PDF or CDF. You can do it in R, right? You have the CDF functions, which would be P norm in this case. You also have that web application, which gives you the total probability up to a certain value, after a certain value, all of that, right? Also, especially when you're doing it in R or that web calculator, it is up to you whether you assume it, the default X or you transform it into a standard norm. If you're using the default X, you'll use mu and sigma square and you will calculate X based on whatever these values are. If you transform them, your new mu and new sigma become zero and one. And instead this, the final, the, the small X that's going to change. So I would like to show it to you for one of these, but give it a try for all of these through one of these methods, okay? Like try with a normal distribution and a standard normal distribution using R and the website. Once you do the whole thing, it's going to be very, very clear in your mind, okay? So it's, it's just a suggestion, but it's really going to help you, all right? So basically, so which of the four? So let's say, let's calculate um, this one. Okay, let's calculate this. So we're looking at probability that X is more than 22 kgs, right? So one way could solve it would be one minus X is less than 22. This is one option. So this we'll, we'll see, right? The other thing we can do is we can do Z and or maybe we can do one minus Z less than. So 22 minus 20 divided by Sigma. So Sigma is going to be two. This thing, which is one minus probability Z less than. So 22 minus 20 is two, two divided by two is one. So this thing. Right. So let's again take a look at these things through um, this one. So the first one where the mean was 20 and sigma was 2. I was interested in, so let's say it is, we can directly do a greater than thing also here. So greater than 22. So this gave us 0.15866. Okay, so 0 0.15866. Now, when I have a standard normal, so 0 and 1. Now I'm looking at, so it needs to be less than 1 or greater than 1 in this case. I get the same value, right? 0 0.15866. Now, if I have a standard So, irrespective of how you solve, this value is going to give you 0 0.1815866, right? Likewise, you can solve all of these. Um, so I just wanted to show one of these to you again. So when I have the original thing so that I don't have to calculate it too much. So now you see. When I do a greater than 25, the last one option, you see there's a very small chunk which is here, right? So if you remember, we had looked at uh, this formula where 99.7% of your observations were within six sigma difference about the mean, right? So three sigma here and three sigma here. So about 20, three sigma is going to be 26, 14, 26. So when we're looking at 25, you've almost covered the whole thing, right? It's it's a very little bit is left. So suppose when I change it to 28, see, it's now almost zero. It's almost nothing. So it's at the very large, very end, fifth, six, seven decimal places, now something is coming. So this is how tapering the values are at the end. Okay. Um, okay. We still have time, right? Yeah, okay, fine. Now, uh, the number of bits which are received in a digital communication channel, uh, so that number and 
whatever they are received in error, they follow a random normal distribution. Sorry, they follow a binomial random distribution and um, assume that the probability, so the number that are being received in error is one upon 10 to the power five. So that's 10 to the power minus five. And if the total number bits transmitted are 16 into 10 to the power six, what is the probability that 150 or fewer errors have occurred? So again, you have binomial distribution here. Okay, so n is 16 into 10 to the power 6. P is 1 into 10 to the power minus 5. And the value of x you are interested in, so it's less than 150. This probability is what you want to find. And the thing is, as was shown in one of the lectures, CDF calculation for binomial distribution is very difficult. So for discrete random variables, calculating PMF or yeah, probability mass function, it's 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 more intuitive, it's more straightforward, and that's what mostly we are interested in. How many things would happen at that time? But when you're looking at cumulative, you need to calculate binomial for everything. So x is equal to one, x is equal to two, x is equal to 50, 50, 100, 150, everything, which becomes very difficult and very time consuming. So we had seen how you can approximate a binomial distribution to a standard normal distribution, especially if NP and everything that we were seeing, the variance and expectations of these values were greater than five, which they are in this case, right? So NP here is going to be a multiplication. So that's 160, which is definitely greater than five, right? So you can approximate it. So you remember the formula is going to become Z, less than this 150, you're going to add 0.5 to it, you're going to subtract NP from it, and you're going to divide, I think, NP into one minus P, right? This was the formula. So once you solve this, so I think I just have it solved somewhat. So this thing, this thing when you solve is going to come to minus 0.75. Okay, so Z less than minus 0 0.75. And then you can solve this, right? It's going to be a standard normal. So you put this value here. Um, so let's say we're putting zero. This one's one. This is minus 0 0.75. And we're interested in the lesser than thing. So we get 2266, right? So we get the right thing. Whether you do a P norm, or whether you do it through this, or whether you use a table, um, you'll get the same answer, right? So that's 0 0.2266, okay? All right. Very similar on those lines. You can have, you can do it for a Poisson distribution also, right? Mean in this case, so, um, just to confirm, so mean for a Poinsot distribution and the variant, they're both lambda, right? So lambda in this case is 1000. What is the probability that 950 are fewer particles, right? So x less than 950. So when you want to approximate z, that's going to become 950 plus 0 0.5 minus lambda divided by root of lambda Similarly, you can solve this thing. It's going to give you some value here, and that's going to give you the probability. I think I have that also written. So it's minus 1.57, and it's going to give you 0 0.58, Okay. I'm just noting it down so that even if it feels rushed at the moment, if you would like to try it later, you have the solution with you. Okay. Yes, what happened? Am I rushing it too much? Is it voice or distribution? Yes, it says here, right? In the question.
oh okay wait so let me uh let me erase the whole thing again oh am i not able to erase it okay wait so lambda is thousand right so what we had seen here Mm, this one right so whenever we are converting so the first thing is you are transforming a Poisson distribution to a normal distribution and then Poisson to normal is the approximation and then from that normal you are converting it into a standard normal so two steps overall what you have to do is so here in the question the question said, what is the probability that 950 or fewer particles are entering the hole? So this is the probability you want to find, okay? That x, x is your original random variable, which has Poisson distribution. So x is less than 950, okay? This you can solve with the CDF of the Poisson distribution, which was talked about in the last week. But that will be a little complicated. It's going to be... um. It's it's just going to be a lot of calculation. So what can be done instead is you are approximating it to a normal or a standard normal distribution. Now what we do for that, so now uh, this thing is being converted into this. So x is being converted into z. So what are we doing here? So x minus lambda divided by root of lambda, that would be less than line 50 minus lambda divided by root of lambda. I'm going simple algebra here. Okay. So probability. Now this thing, whenever for a normal, so I'm assuming that x is now going to be a normal distribution, right? Because Poisson distribution can be approximated to a normal distribution when mean and variance are greater than 5. Mean and variance are greater than 5 here. So this thing I'm approximating to a standard normal. I'm calling it a standard normal. And then this thing stays the same. 950 minus 1000 divided by root of 1000. However, there was one important correction that was talked that whenever you're approximating a discrete to a continuous, you should add 0.5 to it. Okay, so this was minus 50. So I'll just add 0.5 to it. So this becomes 49.5 and root of 1000, whatever that is. So once you solve this, so it's, you go from here to here to here, and then you go here. So this value, 49.5 divided by root 1000, it would come up to minus, uh, sorry, this is minus here. So this would come up to minus 1.57 and standard normal uh, CDF at point at minus 1.57 is 0 0.058. Okay. Again, it's a slightly difficult thing, no doubt. It took me a long time to understand this as well. But practice and try to watch some video part of it again. It would become clearer. Okay. Um, so suppose again here also. Um, so now we're talking about the exponential distribution. Okay. The battery of a car it wears out with an average thousand kilo thousand ten thousand kilometers. And a person desires to take a trip of at least 5,000 kilometers. So what is the probability that the trip is completed without replacing the battery? Right? So again, so if you remember for a for an exponential distribution, expectation is 1 by lambda. Variance is 1 by lambda square. Now, just a word of caution. Both Poisson distribution and exponential distribution have lambda as the parameter. But don't get confused. Okay, the formulas are all very different. The formulas for expectation and variance are also very different. So, but but don't get confused. Try to remember them, keep them separate. Okay. 
so here so expectation right expectation of x is equal to 10000 that is equal to 1 by lambda so this means that lambda is equal to 1 by 10000 okay and now a person desires to take a trip of at least 5,000 kilometers. So probability that X is greater than 5,000. Um, right? So now CDF is 1 minus exponential minus lambda X. So this is going to be 1 minus X. 1 minus CDF. And CDF is 1 minus exponential minus lambda x. Okay. So that's going to be 1. This 1 and 1 gets cancelled. This minus minus becomes plus. So it's exponential minus lambda x. And that's exponential minus 1 by 10,000. X is 5,000. So it's exponential minus 1 by 2. Right. So yeah, so you can you can solve this. I think I hope I have not made any error. Yeah. So it should come up to 0 0.067. Yeah. Fine. I hope okay. Just two people. I hope you this is making sense. Okay. Similar to this, again, there's another question. So here you've directly been given the value of lambda. What is the probability that there are no logons in an interval of six minutes? So the logons are going to be after six minutes, right? So again, very similar x greater than six, you need to calculate. And also what is the probability that the time until the next login is between two and three minutes? Okay, one important thing that you need to actually do here. So this is sort of the type of question where units are important. So now lambda, so lambda and uh, average, they have opposite units, right? They have inverse units here. So lambda has a per hour unit. Okay. So the random variable that we're talking about should have hour as the units. Right now it is minutes. So this is going to become 0.1 hour and this is going to become 2 by 60 and 3 by 60. So that's equal to 0 0.033 hours and this is going to become 0 0.0 uh, 2 0.05 hours uh, this is really important because if you solve x greater than 6 it's going to give you a wrong answer but if you solve x greater than 0.1 that's fine okay are we good for this and then you can do it the same way so I'll just tell you the answers probability that x is greater than 0 0.1 and probability that x is between 0 0.05 and 0 0.033. So these are the two things you want to calculate. And these values are going to be 0 0.82 and 0 0.152. 82, 0.152. Yep. Okay. All right. Perfect. Great. Fine. Uh, the next few questions are very simple. So quickly give me the answers. Which of the following options can be the outcome of, if you run the command? Are you NIF? 7, 5, 10. So in this order, if you don't write the name of the arguments, if you just order the arguments correctly, what does 7 mean? What does 5 mean? And what does 10 mean? So are UNIF random number generator of the um, uniform distribution, right? 
So how many outcomes is it giving and between what and what values? That's what seven, five and 10 are, right? So this one, you should be able to tell me. No. Okay. But do try because this is not very difficult. Right? So 7 is number, right? This is n here. 5 is the minimum and this is the maximum. Right? So maximum can be 10, minimum has to be 5. Right? So in all of these, it looks like um, so for example, this one here cannot be there. Right? Rest everything looks fine. It's within the range. But now we need only seven observations. This is four observations. So this can't be there. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten observations. This also cannot be there. So T is the right answer. Okay. Very, very simple. Now, if X is a normal random variable and mean is um, five and the variance, which is sigma square, is 25. And this phi is denoting the distribution function of the standard normal variate. Um, is actually denoting, I should say, the cumulative cumulative distribution function. Then P, uh, so this is standard, right? So P x less than 10. Now it's again the same thing, x less than 10. So what we want to do is we want to convert it to a standard normal. So how do we convert? We subtract mu and we divide by sigma. So what we do is we subtract mu, which is 5, and we divide by sigma, which is also 5 here, right? Root of 25. So we get z. 10 minus 5 is 5. 5 divided by 5 is 1. So this is going to be pi 1. The second thing, x greater than minus 5. Now, x greater than minus 5. So, let's try and just continue solving it. So, x minus mu divided by sigma is greater than minus 5, minus 5 divided by 5. That is z greater than so minus 5 minus 5 is minus 10 minus 10 by 5 is minus 2 now if you remember uh greater than minus 2 and less than 2 it's going to be symmetric All right so if i draw this this is minus 2 this is 2 so this was greater than minus 2. So it is basically this thing, whole thing here. And this is going to be the same as less than minus 2. So this is equal to z less than 2, which is equal to theta of 2. So this becomes the right answer. Okay. Uh, you're not asking questions. I'm assuming this is clear. Fine. There's still time. If you want me to explain it again, I can. But if not, we'll move on to, we have just final two questions left. So can you tell me what command in R are we going to use to calculate the probability that X is between 15 and 25, where X is normally distributed with a mean 5 and variance 16 for a normal distribution, okay? Now, this thing, it's the same thing as this, right? So, don't get confused with the greater than and less than symbol. Typically, always the less than symbol is used because you normally talk about CDFs and CDFs is up to that value. But, it's it can be denoted anyway. So, okay, this one of you is left. Um, so, what command in R are we going to use? 
Do you remember the name of the command that gives you CDF? So we had D, P, Q, and R, right? So we'll be using P uh, norm in this case, right? P norm. The first one is always going to be between what value? So let's say, first of all, we are interested in, let's say, 15. And then mean is going to be 5. Standard deviation is 4, right? Um, likewise, we'll have... P norm at 25, mean is 5, standard deviation is 4, and then you subtract this. So 25 minus 15, right? Then this is the thing. Um, this is mean is 5. So we are interested in, let's say this is 25 somewhere here, 15 is somewhere here. We are interested in this area. So everything before 25 minus everything before 15. This gives you the region between 50 and 25. So that's it. And the last question. So in a large computer network, uh, the user login, again, can be, let's say it's modeled as, so the exponential. So the mean is four. So lambda is going to be one by four. And what command in R will you use to generate eight random observations? So again, the R command here is going to be N EXP. So you give it, you say it's eight, and then you give it the value of lambda, which is going to be 0 0.25. That's it. That's going to give you the answer. Um, okay, so I don't think it's, a lot useful to be discussing the answers right now because they're not a lot of people. But if there is any particular question that you uh, would like to discuss from the last week's assignment, um, assignment six here, then we can talk about it or we can discuss it in one of the later lectures. Was there any question that you particularly want are doubtful about or anything? Um, if not, we can always discuss this in one of the later lectures. That's okay. I don't think there was a lot of confusion. I mean, the answers and the solutions were mostly explanatory. But if there's something, just let me know. Otherwise, that's okay. Today's problem, number seven. Uh, this one. This one, right? Yeah, okay. So, um, what's the confusion in this one? Oh, R unif is the... So, if you remember... Uh, one second. Okay. So, we had seen here that R unif has these three inputs. The first input is how many things you want to... How many random numbers you want to generate? And UNIF is for the uniform continuous random variable, right? So for that, you have A and B, lower limit and upper limit. So um, so let's say, so in this question here, we had 7, 5, and 10, okay? So this was 7, this was 5, and this was 10. So what this means is that give me seven random variables when you, that would normally follow a uniform distribution between five and 10. So I need seven outputs, all should be between five and 10. Every time do you run this, you're going to get different outcomes, right? So if I run it today, I might get this output, but if I run it tomorrow, I might get a very different output. So it's not going to be the same ever, right? So the first one had only four outputs. This one had 10 outputs, so these can't be correct. This one has a value greater than 10, but it has to be between 5 and 10. So I'm only left with option D here. Okay. All right. So we'll discuss the assignment six some other time. But for now, I think we are done with R unif is random unif, basically. A random number generator for uniform distribution.
okay r unif it's like that so r norm is going to be normal and so on and so forth all right so thank you so much for attending the session um the deadline for this week would be next wednesday and uh, i'll upload the session recording and the pdf of this ppt and as well as the r script to the google drive and youtube and everywhere i'll meet you all next week on uh, next friday okay 15th of march so thank you so much um good night and bye bye all right i'll end the meeting then